Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Politics in the Pulpit, a lectionary-based preaching resource designed to ask the provocative questions of how politics might appear in our preaching this week. My name's the Reverend Chris Upton. For 23 years, I preached out of West Lane Baptist Church in Haworth, but now I'm sat here in the Christians Against Poverty Officer office, where I work as the church funding officer. I'm also the national lead to the Waterways Chaplaincy. And today is my last week as a host. Next week, my guest today, Reverend Jackie Embry, will be taking over as host. Jackie has just retired uh, from serving the URC as moderator in the Mersey Synod. She's also preached and worked in church leadership around Bolton and Salford and in Birmingham. And she's now retired to the wonderful town, I think, of Kendall. Is that right, Jackie? Yes, indeed, yes. It is great to have you with us this morning. Thank you very much for coming. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Uh, have you had much to do with j Pitt before we go any further? A little, a little. Um, I've tried to pass on possibilities to people um, and enthuse them about doing what is on their hearts. And Jay Pitt is really helpful in providing possibilities and uh, waking folk up to things. Great. Thank you. Some headlines that Jay Pitt have re reminded us to think on as we prepare our Sunday services. The Conservative plan to send refugees to Rwanda was blocked by the Supreme Court. We shall see how that pans out. Oxfam has reported that the richest 1% account for more carbon emissions than the poorest 66%. In Argentina, Javier Milley has won the presidential election, a far-right libertarian. The situation in Gaza is still going from bad to worse. The African Union and CARICOM members from the Caribbean established Global Reparations Fund and call for formal apologies from the European nations. There's a big heat wave affecting Brazil with feel-like temperatures of over 58 degrees, despite the summer still being a month away. But a piece of good news to finish. China's CO2 emissions are forecast to start decreasing from next year, where records have been broken for installation of low carbon infrastructure. Lots going on. Keep your radio, keep your media coming in as you prepare for your services this week. But our lectionary Sunday, it's Christ the King. And our lectionary Sunday for year A, Ezekiel 34, Ephesians 1, 15 to 23, Matthew 25, the sheep and the goats, and Psalm 100. So, Jackie. What jumped out at you as you began looking at these texts? How would you prepare for politics from the pulpit if you were in pastorate ministry this Sunday? I think I'd major on the Ezekiel and the Matthew readings, uh, but there was a couple of really interesting things that sprang out from the other two. Um, I, I'd use Psalm 95, actually, as the um, call to worship. And that's it's this praise psalm, but it does um, talk about us being the sheep of the pasture. So it, it leads you in nicely. And then the last line is, oh, that today you would listen to his voice. So that's a really good start for a service. And that's a line that's not even kept in in the lectionary. So that's 95 7B rather than 7A. Yeah. yeah OK. Uh so that's the call to worship. And does it always strike you as odd, as it does me, that it's Christ the King, and yet we're talking about sheep and pastures and shepherds? It does, but then this this figure of a shepherd was certainly in ancient times a, a figure that uh, was also kingship. Um, so, for example, the Pharaoh had that crook uh, because he was the shepherd of the people. Mm. Now, how the shepherding went... Um, with this kingship might be questionable and I guess that's part of what Ezekiel's talking about um, but nevertheless it, it was associated with kings. 
I've heard one commentator talk about Christ the King Sunday being slightly archaic, or, although in England we do now have a king. There, there's a recognition that that sort of nomenclature might put people off. And, and they suggested, how about culture of Christ Sunday rather than Christ the King Sunday? Does that mean anything to you? It's, I think, probably a completely different thing. I mean, yes, a culture of Christ would be brilliant. Um, and that's what we're, I guess that's what the kingdom is. Mm. So, yeah, it, it is this word. Because we talk about the kingdom happily, but not about the king, which is interesting. And I wonder if that's something to do with our innate realisation that power disparities are problematical. Sorry, say that again. We... We know instinctively that power differences are problematical. Mm. Um, if you like, it's unless the person who has the power is Christ mm. um, or someone who is absolutely Christ-like, which never happens. It's this bit about power corrupting and absolute power corrupting absolutely. Yeah, yes, yeah. Again, as we will dig into the text. We must dig into the text. But there's something about um, Christ bringing the margins into the centre and yeah. sidelining those who feel at, at the centre. And the king is always at the centre of the kingdom. And yet Christ is the one that brings the margins to the centre. So, yes, strange paradox, even as we start talking about Christ the King Sunday. Anyway, Ezekiel or Matthew, where, where would you like to go? Um, I would start with Ezekiel. OK. Apart from anything else, this may well be what Jesus had in mind um, mm -hmm. when he was um, making his parable. And it's it's interesting because we come to the, the shepherd and, and, and we talk about tending for the flock, caring, healing. But the word that seems to come out more than any other is feeding, um, which... I think is a is a lovely word because of course feeding is physical but it's not just physical and yet i look in verse 20 i myself will judge between the fat sheep and the lean sheep and the fat sheep are going to get pushed to the side so there's something about feeding but also something about not overfeeding is yeah well i think the idea is that the fat sheep are those who have grabbed for themselves Okay. And in fact, the, the lectionary reading leaves out of the, the um, couple of verses before verse 20, which is to do with the, the fat sheep, if you like, those who are grabbing for themselves a, a bigger share. And not just grabbing that, but trampling the, the, the grass and such like so that nobody else can, can get in. Um, okay. And the implication <laughs> is that if you're well fed, there's a problem if everybody else isn't well fed. So I would personally read the whole the whole thing and not leave those verses out. Again, the re revised common lectionary culls some useful stuff in the middle for want of saving a bit of time, but making it a bit more yeah. opaque. So that we've got fat sheep and thin sheep, and we've got the flock, my flock. Is that two different flocks? of fat and thin or, or one flock that contains both the Lord being the, the shepherd to everybody or? I think it is one flock and I think God is everybody's shepherd, but I think there is a, there's a, there's a lot of sheep that need more shepherding than others because they have, have grabbed what they need, needed and left everybody else to, to flounder, so to speak. Um, I, I I don't think I've noted Ezekiel 34, maybe because I naturally tend to go to Matthew 25 and the sheep and the goats rather than the fat sheep and the thin sheep. And I guess the medium sheep in the middle. Um, and although sheep and goats, where well, we'll probably go there in a bit, is obviously a binary distinction between one another. Fat, thin is a binary, but they're both still sheep. And uh, I'm I'm just always interested in the sort of dualistic nature of 
how we read the scriptures, where we want a simple distinction, a binary. Do you think that's what Ezekiel is setting up here, uh, a, a nice simplistic, or, or is there something else as well going on? I mean, like you, but there's got to be a gradation of fatness and thinness. Um, I guess that Ezekiel's looking at either extreme, and, and quite possibly we do. Um, you know, in those statistics that you gave earlier, mm. we're talking about the top 1% and a good many others, but there are, um, there is a spread, and by and large, the condemnation is on those who have the possibility to help others, but aren't. Mm. And I guess that's primarily mm. the top 1%. Um, mm. or no, not primarily, but the most stark difference will be with the top 1%, so to speak. Mm. When it goes at the end of the, uh, of the text into, I will set up over them one shepherd my servant David he shall feed them he shall feed them and be their shepherd uh David and Jesus directly paralleled or is this a historical thing that Ezekiel is talking about or obviously we've got son of David coming on now yeah I mean yes it, all this leads beautifully into Advent mm. I think the in Ezekiel's this part of Ezekiel is the part that is looking looking forward to salvation, if you like. Mm -hmm. And although David's in the past, we're probably talking about a David-like figure, um, which is what mm -hmm. Christ was. Um, yeah, it, it yeah. is where Christ was coming from. Um, I don't know whether he was really thinking about, you know, David being revived, so to speak. Hmm. No, no, I don't think I was going there. I'm, I, again, I'm just, it's the, the local nuance of, of Ezekiel using the story of the people of God that he has inherited uh, and sort of projecting forwards into what does it mean? to bring the outsiders, to bring the thin at the expense of the fat or, or for the fat to give space and give room for all people so that one flock will go forwards under one king and that um, the particular event of the shepherd king David, the good king, the archetypal good king, looking after the whole um, yeah, Should so we move on to Matthew 25 then? How many times will you have preached on this text, Jackie, in your career? Well, uh, quite a few. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it is a really striking text, obviously. Yeah. And you're absolutely right when you said that we tend to individualise it because we're concerned about us. Mm. Um, I mean, what strikes me most at the moment is the way that the those who had helped others didn't see that they had done you know that, that they'd helped Jesus along the way so to speak mm. they they were as surprised as as those who were on the goat side yeah. um it, it which is interesting and it certainly starts to to um to put aside the thought that you're doing, if you like, good stuff to try and, and get saved. Mm. Um, it's mm. it's the consequence of being good that you're doing good stuff. Mm. Um, so we don't need to worry as reformed Christians that we're... Um... <laughs> it, I think it's worth highlighting uh, the, the the Greek in, in 2532, that autois, that the, the King James translated it, them, uh, and the NRSV, which is my go-to text, translates it as people. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate, King James, them. I separate the nations, so you'll have nations that are sheep and nations that are goats. Or the NRSV 
NIV now talks about people, us, individuals. And yeah, there's strikingly different theologies about is this an individualistic or is this... And it does seem to me to fit better with the King James, this idea of everything else in Matthew's gospel is about the collapse of kingdoms rather than the eternal destiny of individuals. And the, a kingdom that overlooks the poor will bring destruction on itself because it will fall apart rather than because it's the Lord smiting as such. Uh, so I do like that little bit of Greek that, that just gets thrown in there. And then the other end, eternal punishment and the righteous into eternal life. How do you understand that, Jackie? It's a difficult one. Um, a lot of people find the last lines not what they want to hear. Mm. And I think it is... It is difficult to imagine a merciful God condemning people eternally. Mm. Um, but that said, there should be... I, I think the punishment will come from us realising what, how badly we've done, what we've got wrong. Um, and rather than necessarily from God doing anything to us, so to speak. This um, idea of, yeah, the wrath of God or our wrath that we inflict upon ourselves. Yeah. 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 Again, I think the, um, just thinking about the, the, the Greek sort of nuance of that phrase um, and how different the timeless platonic kind of ideas world as opposed to the Hebraic, you know, there is nothing other than the enfleshed world and that the age, Aeonion, is just a different age. An age to come will be rough or an age to come will be with God, but it's not a timeless out of embodied existence as such. And the eternal fire prepared for the devil and angels it's not a timeless thing. It's a time bounded thing, uh, a time of fire rather than an eternal fire. And the destruction of you know, Rome and AD 70 and all of that, it was on the cards. Uh, Absolutely. And I mean, all this, if you like, started with Ezekiel, who was the whole time he was preaching in exile because he went in the first exile, so to speak. So although he was preaching, um, Judah, you better pull your socks up. He, yeah. At the time, he was in exile. So everything he knows, he, he he's kind of, there's been a line. Something new has to happen. Yeah. And at that stage, when he's preaching salvation, he's preaching this, almost this new kingdom. Mm. And we're going to get it right this time. Mm. Um. So he is looking for a, a fresh sheet. And, and again, we, you know, when we come to the judgment, we're talking about, can we, you know, what happens then? Hmm. Can it be um, right, considering how many times we have tried and we're still not getting it right? It, it was on this Sunday, uh, about 10 years ago, where I was halfway through my sermon and, and somebody stood up and shouted, you're a heretic, uh, and walked out. Um, I don't know if that's happened to you. I, I prefaced my sermon saying, this is a sermon of two halves. Please listen to the second half if the first half has upset you. And, and they didn't listen to the second half. The first half was too upsetting. But it was inspired by a quote from John Dominic Crossan's book, God and Empire, that seems relevant. Uh, I'll, read it to you and we'll just get your reflections on it. The person that walked out, I think, was quite keen for the Matthew text to be about individuals and individual salvation. And I was suggesting this, that it was more about nations and, and that this wasn't a physical second coming of Christ that's being spoken about. Dominic Crossan says this, 
The second coming of Christ is not an event that we should expect to happen soon, violently or literally. The second coming of Christ is what will happen when we Christians finally accept that the first coming was the only coming and start to cooperate with its divine presence. The idea of the age to come has come because of Christ already rather than is being teed up to come back. Does that resonate with you or, or am I a heretic? I don't think you're a heretic. Um, I think there is this tension right the way through about of come and coming. Yeah. Um, and I mean, that, I guess, brings me just very quickly to Ephesians mm. because it's a lovely reading, but a lot of it doesn't immediately easily tie in with Ezekiel and with um, the Matthew. But there is a line in it where Paul is asking for the Ephesians to be granted the spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him, him being Christ. Mm. Now, Paul spent a long time with the Ephesians and presumably preaching Christ. So it's a real acknowledgement that we do need wisdom and we do need to grow in Christ and to get to know Christ more all the time. And, and that is part of, I guess, what the coming and, 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 and the come to me. Mm. Um, it's about us all growing in Christ and into Christ and becoming more Christ-like. Um, so, Given that this is the last Sunday in the Christian calendar, do you, have you, would you commend our listeners to do some kind of audit in terms of what have you learned about Christ this year? What have you come to know about Christ through the last 52 weeks? Is that something you've done, a sort of a, a spiritual stock take, encourage people to use this Sunday? I haven't attached it to this specific Sunday, but I think that's a really good idea, uh, particularly because, as you say, we start again mm. uh, in Advent. And I think it would be an excellent way to use the apocalypse readings that, that, that we tend to have on, on Christ the King Sunday. Um, and just think, you know, what, how, how have I, have I, my understanding of, of Christ and, and my doing of being Christian, how have they changed over the last year? Mm. I, think, I think I have done it, but probably only once. And partly it was a cop out because I was so scared about the apocalyptic readings and, and I wanted to get away from the sort of judgment, um, which I, I, I do understand now, I think because of the sort of moving it away from the individualistic back into the King James, it's the nations that are judging themselves and nations that don't center the margins and, you know, they fall. And we've seen that with Rome and Babylon and everybody, unless a nation looks after the edges and the poor, it, it condemns itself. So, yeah, I, but I have used it as a what have you learned and, and thrown it out to people. But I've never noticed until you just pointed that 117 of Ephesians. Spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him. Uh, it's a lovely wee text, I suppose. Yeah, and, and I mean, all of this has to move us to to where Jesus is, which is looking after the little ones and, and thinking whatever we're doing, what effect does it have on those who are most in need? Yeah. I mean, all those things that you mentioned at the beginning are to do with people who are most in need. Yeah. And that's where Jesus was, with his eyes very much open. Um, and, and somebody pointed out a, a quote to me um, when we were talking about this text a, a week or so ago, and they, they found this quote, I'm sorry, I can't remember who, who, was, who said it, so apologies to whoever it was who said it, but it was to do with not simply um if you like helping the needy but 
would Jesus um, in effect think that we had reached out to him in, in others if we simply send a check to someone and don't, you know, which is then used to feed somebody. Mm. Or if we simply give our clothes away, um, say to the Salvation Army and expect the Salvation Army to do the clothing. Mm. Or should we be closer, if you like, mm. to those in need and, and have our eyes opened mm. um, to, to people's situations more? Because it is very easy to be insulated and still think that you are, and you are giving. I, I don't want to knock it. And and for some people, um, you know, it's physically impossible for them to to do any more. Um, but it is a very interesting question. <laughs> yeah, I um, because of the conflict in Gaza uh, over the last few weeks, we've often started with the problems that are so seemingly insurmountable and in our face. Today, we've started very much with the texts. And how, how would you, would you start with the texts and move into the newspaper? Would you start with the story of the day? And I tend to start with the texts, but they always relate to the story of the day. Yeah. Um, and if, you know, if we take the story of the day as a situation in Gaza, we're talking about the sheep and 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 Ezekiel's sheep and the fat sheep and the thin sheep and particularly those verses that are missed out of mm. tre tre treading down the grass so mm. that there is nothing um mm. for the thin sheep and I guess I mean my my difficulty with with the way you're reading the the nations as being a whole nation and I, I absolutely agree with you that a nation isn't going to stand forever if they can't get things right and yeah. that includes us by the way yeah yeah um, but hang on i've lost my thread slightly um it was the nations oh, or the nations people. yeah um you need to you need to get beyond the whole nation because we're not condemning the whole nation because part of the nation people who come from the nation have done something bad and it's how you tease that out, um, because it doesn't, the fact that you don't want to condemn the whole nation doesn't mean that you don't want to root out that which is not good. And, and I don't know how you square that circle. And I think I, I was balking when you were saying condemn the whole nation as much as it doesn't matter at all. If I condemn a nation, the nation condemns itself and yeah. will tear itself apart and will either thrive or fall, not by the riches getting richer, but by the folk on the margins being brought into the centre. As you said, the you know the the thin sheep being invited to feed, where the fat sheep stand aside rather than trample and use their power. And I think we we're back almost to where we began with um, feeding, clothing, freeing, and not noticing it. And nowhere in there is a prayer of confession or a, a Jesus is Lord statement. So it seems paradoxical to use this as a, um, a call to a private faith in that classic uh, evangelical mould that I was converted into, where I would have seen this very clearly as a there are two ways to live kind of mentality. Um but I, I do, I read it slightly differently. Yeah. I was reading yeah, no. T. Wright as well. His just quote on this, nations that don't follow God's path to peace in King Jesus end in destruction. So yeah. he's a central sort of figure there as well. All the nations will be gathered. I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. I guess the, the difficulty is that the nation isn't monochrome. No. Um, and, and those who have least power within the nation, who are not being brought to the centre, are all, you know, are, are equally well going to be part of the destruction. Yeah. And, yeah. and, and that's, yeah, a difficult situation. It, it's horrendous. Um, and calls, it's, it's the politics in the pulpit where we're called 
throw eggs as well as give balm. Um, really, really interesting and tricky. So we've got maybe just five more minutes or something. Um, a couple of questions I, I tend to ask people. And just yesterday, I uh, at four o'clock gathered with 50 others for prayers in our parish church. I wasn't leading it. Uh, and we, we saw on the screen and we heard prayers from Israel, Palestine. Uh, and it was a national thing 4,000 miles away. Question I often ask is it is it local politics or national politics or international politics that you preach about with from the pulpit or is it a mixture of all three? I would say it's a mixture. Um, mm -hmm. Part of the reason for that is I mean you you've got to to work locally because that's what people know and that's often where they can make more impact. Mm. Um, but equally. The national and the international, a might it, people need to work where they where they feel called, and some will feel called to to write letters and to make, to do protest either nationally or internationally, and I guess I feel my job is to try and help people find that passion, because mm. you can't work on everything. Mm. Mm. I mean, J Pitt's got a huge spread of um things that that they produce information on nobody can get involved in them all mm. but it's the thing that that is really nagging at you that you can't stop being mm. concerned about that's the thing you should be spending your time on mm. and it'll be different for different people mm. Mm. so if i'm preaching i should be trying to over time show people how they can get involved in different ways um in different things how much of yourself do you put into the pulpit with your politics do you do the on one hand some people think this on others some people think that or do you say this is me this is where i stand this is my private reflection I certainly try and avoid trying to necessarily give people solutions where there might be a variety of solutions. Mm. I think some, in some things, and I guess this is where party politics I definitely stay out of, mm. um, it's, there's a problem. Now the question is how you solve that problem. But mm. the first thing is to recognize there's a problem and for people to either try and address it or try and point it out to those who can address it. Um, but I guess I would certainly um, make people aware that I think that it is a problem, mm -hmm. uh, whatever we're talking about. So, I mean, some things are so obvious, um, but for example, um some of the eco things that we've been talking about for very many years are are only now becoming um widely accepted um and then the, there are other things no doubt that we're talking about now that other people will will pick up later on um mm. i i hate to think what it is we're missing which there will be a lot of things mm. um, because you look back and you say how could they but they, um, you know, were, were the, the, Doing, no, we haven't suddenly become better people. We've just uh, grown in Christ and listened to one another. Yeah. As we have come to know him, we have suddenly noted slavery, misogyny, colonialism, whatever it is that's coming to us next. And I think you're absolutely right. We must be humble in the pulpit because 95% of what we say today, we may not believe tomorrow, like the science and stuff yeah. like this. And certainly I'm always clear, I'm preaching to myself as much as anybody else. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, that, uh, that sort of humility, I think, is important as well. One last question. I think you may have already answered it. Um, is, the pul is the pulpit a place for questions or a place for answers? 
I would say more questions than answers. Mm. Um, not least because different people have different parts of the answer. Mm. But also because it has to come from them. It's not, you can't tell somebody what to believe or, or what to do. They need to see the need themselves. We're back, I guess we're back to that uh, awareness and wisdom, aren't we? I think so. Get wisdom, get understanding, though. It costs you everything. Yeah. Jackie, thank you ever so much uh, for being our guest today on Politics in the Pulpit. I've really enjoyed our conversation and I look forward to watching you host in the weeks to come as well as I wrestle with the text and understand, you know, the minutiae of what's going on. Thank you very much, Jackie. I hope you've enjoyed it. I have indeed. And thank you very much. You're very welcome. Uh, thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. To the rest of you uh, watching at home or walking the dog or on the tube, be it Saturday night or, or Monday or Tuesday, who knows? Uh, if you have enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review wherever you listen to your podcast and do share this with your friends. We also have some online spaces for further engagement and discussion about faith in politics on X, Twitter as was, at pulpit underscore politics or using the hashtag politics in the pulpit or one word. We also have a Facebook group which you can access through the joint public issues team jpit.uk. Let's go into both our politics and our pulpit with a blessing, a general prayer for Christ the King Sunday, or perhaps culture of Christ Sunday, who knows? Lord of the past and the future, we thank you for the past church year and the fellowship and joy of our worship together as a community. And we pray for the year to come, that we may benefit from the teaching and wisdom of the church and its preachers and grow in faith and knowledge of you. We offer you our hopes and dreams for the future. So take us and mould us into the people and preachers you would have us be. Amen. God bless and go well this week. <laughs>